True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. When two teenage sisters were arrested for murdering their 43-year-old mother in the Toronto suburb of Mississauga, the community was shocked. Shock was followed by outrage when it came out that many of their friends had been aware of the murder plot. Some had even offered advice on the best way to kill their mother and to get away with it. Canadian law has supported treating minors guilty of serious crimes differently from their adult counterparts. So as a result, the young killers served short sentences and their privacy has been protected. The hope with this treatment is that young offenders can be reintegrated into society and contribute in a positive way. Despite the court's ruling to keep their names a secret, their names are searchable online. But for our discussion, we decided to use the pseudonyms that were used by former Toronto Star journalist, Bob Mitchell. Join us at the Quiet End today. We're going to talk about the cold-blooded murder of Linda Anderson by her daughters Sandra and Beth. In addition to the dysfunctional family relationships in the Anderson family, we hope to examine the psychology behind the girls' friends, who chose to keep quiet and in many cases help out. Yeah, it's a tough case. It's really astonishing to me. How many people knew this was going to happen, knew that it happened, and didn't say anything. It's very discouraging about our youth. I hate to say it. Well, I'm I'm just hoping that the majority of them or all of them thought that the girls were just kidding, but that's not true. Well, sure, but what about afterwards when they were providing alibis? I know. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll get into that. It's crazy. So what are we drinking for a beer? It better be a crazy beer. Well, it's not crazy. It's a Toronto beer. It's Steam Whistle Premium Pale Ale from Steam Whistle Brewing in Toronto. Uh, this is an American pale ale. Uh, it's a nice low ABV of 5%, so we can drink a couple of these. And it's a pretty good beer. It's not real great. It's not terrible. Nice gold color, thick white head, tons of lace. Very pretty looking beer. Got an aroma of grain, some sweet malt, some floral hops. Then taste is more of a bready, you know, white bread taste, a little bit of citrus, and some hops late in the taste. It's a light-bodied, easy-drinking beer. So we can carry a few of these down to the quiet end and share with our buddies. Okay, but before we go any further, I think we need to address the elephant or ghost in the room. That would be pumpkin beer season. And your point is? Well, how do you feel about it? I mean, it's a big thing in coffee, the pumpkin spice, and I know it's a big thing in beer, the pumpkin beers. And I know you've been critical of many of them, some of the more popular ones. So how do you feel about them this year? Are you going to try some? Well, of course. I always try them. But my gripe about pumpkin beers is that too many of them are just full of pumpkin spice. So you you got a bunch of cinnamon and nutmeg and stuff like that, and not much pumpkin. And I, I grant you the pumpkin isn't that great a flavor, or much of a flavor. Oh, I love pumpkin. But there's, you talk about pumpkin beers, but it's all pumpkin spice beer. So I think you should label it that way. Okay, but there are some beers that are actual pumpkin, right? Yeah, and I would like to drink those. (laughs) All right. I'm looking forward to it. I enjoy them. But yeah, we'll get into that. We'll drink some pumpkin beers at some point. But I remember back in Maine, they had the pumpkin beer with the um, brown sugar on the rim of your glass, and you were very opposed to that. You were really kind of mean about it. I was probably kind of snotty. Yeah, yeah. What was that beer? Well, it was whatever York River Landing had on tap for a Oktoberfest pumpkin beer. Okay. I thought it was pretty yummy with the brown sugar, but you thought it was an abomination. Well, yeah. You don't put sugar rims on the beer. <laughs> I mean, God. Uh, it's a good girly drink. Exactly. All right. Well, let's open up this one and head on down. Okay. Kevin Bacon's not here today. Shoot. 
He wasn't here last week either, I hate to tell you. You just had a few too many beers. He was in my head. Yeah, I think he was taking up residence in your head. So let's start this story. We can't joke forever. It's a serious story. This is. So we'll, we'll get started. We're going back to 2003. And here we have single mother Linda Anderson, who is depressed and drinking too much. And this was because her relationship with her teenage daughters was not good. Now, her oldest, Sandra, was very resentful that she was doing a lot of the mothering of her little brother, Bobby, because Linda just wasn't capable of doing it. Yeah, and he was five or six years old. He was little. Yeah, he was with another husband, another mate, right? Yes, he had a different father. Now, Sandra is 16, but she'd been through a lot for someone her age. Her 15-year-old sister, Beth, hung out with Sandra most of the time. And at this point, the two girls were just hanging out together, smoking pot, drinking alcohol, and going to parties. And they also were complaining to each other what a terrible mother Linda was to them and Bobby, their little brother. Now, Linda was a nurse, and she was drinking on a daily basis. She'd lost her nursing job and was passed out on the sofa most days. She usually would begin drinking in the mornings, and things just got worse as the day progressed. Relationships had been unlucky for Linda. Her last lover was a guy who was just using her to have sex. Yeah, and it seems like she had feelings for him. And that was something that her oldest daughter would ridicule her for, for being stupid about it. Well, yeah, I mean, the research we did, it seemed like a very one-sided relationship. She might have had hopes that he was going to marry her. He just wanted to have sex with her. Right, right. Well, Linda and her kids lived in a rented townhouse in a poorer area than most of their friends. Sandra was smart, but she was a loner when she was a child. But then in high school, she started making some friends. She'd just finished the 10th grade, and she was pretty popular at that point. Sandra and Beth's friends all seemed to come from families who were more financially stable than they were, and that wasn't difficult. Their parents would give them money and buy them fashionable clothing. They lived in nice houses, some had pools, and they didn't have to cook or clean or care for their younger siblings. So at least this is the way that Sandra and Beth are seeing things, that it's not fair. They thought they deserved the same lifestyle that their peers had. Yeah, that's a pretty far-fetched thought, you know? What do you mean far-fetched? Well, everybody doesn't live the same way. Even if their friends seem to have more money and more privileges, they all didn't. Well, of course not. But, I mean, we are talking about teenagers, and that's the way a lot of teenagers yeah, see things. I, I know. They're yeah. a different species of animal. Exactly. But as we know, as you get more mature, you realize every household has its issues, its problems, and it always looks better from the outside. And that's how they saw it. That's how they looked at it. And unfortunately, they really held it against Linda. She got the brunt of the blame for that. Yeah, well, because Linda wasn't able to do what the girls wanted her to do. I know, but doesn't it just irritate you that it's always the mother when the divorce happens? Why aren't they mad at their father? It's always take it out on the mother who's working her ass off to take care of you. Yeah, I don't have a good answer for that. But I mean, that's we, the way it seems to work. We didn't seem to hear much of the father no. in, in this story. No, not a lot. Yeah. So and Linda, meanwhile, she had, hadn't given up on the man who she was interested in marrying, but he apparently wasn't. This was an older guy who was an attorney, and she thought that her life and the life of her children would improve if she got him to marry her. That's just not the way to look at things, is it? Well, I guess not, but we weren't there. We don't know what he was telling her. I know. That's you know, true. he I could know. have been misleading her. True. Linda once had told Sandra, her daughter, that this guy was the best lover she ever had. Now, that's something you share with your kids, isn't it? That's inappropriate, yes. And then she told Sandra that she had stopped taking birth control because she was hoping to get pregnant and lure him into marrying her. Now, that's stupid. And to tell your teenage daughter something like that is doubly stupid. And Sandra was a pretty smart girl, so that made her angry. She already felt like she was a mother to Bobby, and the last thing she wanted was for her mother to bring another child into the situation. So even though they condemned Linda's lifestyle, these two girls were drinking and doing drugs with their friends. They were smoking pot, skipping classes, 
but they saw their drug and alcohol use as different because it was a social thing. They saw Linda's drinking as secretive and pathetic. And Linda did keep bottles of alcohol hidden, and she denied having a drinking problem. But obviously, her life was suffering from it. Things were going downhill for her, and subsequently for her children. She wasn't able to keep a job, and she had a degree. She was a nurse, but you can only show up for work so often with alcohol on your breath or being visibly drunk, and you're not going to keep a job. Exactly. But, you know, there were also indications that although Linda did suffer from alcoholism, she did care about her kids, and at the heart of her, she wasn't a bad person. When Linda was working, she actually worked very frequent and long shifts to help provide for the kids. Sandra would be called upon to babysit Bobby, but Linda would call home often to check on them. And then Sandra would be annoyed by that. Linda's co-workers at the local hospital had really good things to say about Linda. She was kind and caring. She was a hard worker. But, you know, she did have a drinking problem, and she started showing up for shifts with alcohol on her breath, which was a deal breaker, of course. Well, yeah, it's not going to be good for your job longevity, is it? No, especially when you have people's lives in your hands. Yeah, but I think, and, and you said this, I'd emphasize that her co-workers pretty much all had good things to say about her. Yeah, I think you have to realize that alcoholism is a disease and have some empathy here. And I think there was just a huge lack of empathy from Sandra and Beth, which I understand they're teenagers. Yeah, I think that's the job of teenagers to feel like your parents are a bunch of jerks. Yes, and treat them badly. Right. Yeah, true. (laughs) (laughs) So although Sandra resented her mother's failure to keep her job, she was even more unhappy to have her at home all the time. Sandra and Beth told their father that Linda wasn't there for her kids, as she should have been, and that her alcoholism was just getting worse. Now, Dad's response, according to the girls, was he told them to call the police if it was unmanageable. Good advice, Dad. So here's Linda. She's unemployed. She's in love clearly with the wrong guy, and she's deeply in the clutches of an addiction. So she and her kids were clearly in need of help. She wasn't functioning. And Sandra blamed her pretty much for everything that was wrong with their lives. She really did. So Bobby and Beth went to spend the summer of 2002 with their grandparents in Europe. Now, Bobby was only there for a few weeks, so when he returned, Sandra had to take care of him. He was Beth and Sandra's half-brother, but he only spent weekends and holidays with his dad, so his dad wasn't really a full-time father either. No, he wasn't. When Beth returned in the fall... Linda was in really bad shape, and Sandra hated her more than ever. She was convinced that things would never improve, and she wanted to convince Beth that killing their mother would solve all of their problems. So she'd taken a big jump over this time period, from, you know, mom's a real pain in the ass, she sucks, to we're going to kill her. We got to kill her. That is a leap. Of course, at this, this time, she's the only one home with Linda, right? Yes, and then Bobby came home, and she had to take care of Bobby, and she was mad about that. So there's lots of resentment anyway. And she told Beth, you know, our mom doesn't even care about us. Let's do it. Right. Now, back in 2001, Sandra had called the Children's Aid Society to report abuse by Linda's boyfriend, who we'll call Doug. And Linda and Doug had been fighting and drinking heavily. Doug had slapped Linda in front of her kids. So a social worker came to the house. But Sandra and Beth didn't say anything about Linda's drinking at that point. Linda told the social worker how great her daughters were, and she said that they were both responsible and really helped her out watching their little brother while she was at work. So they kind of did the cover-up thing when the social worker showed up. But then a couple of months later, Sandra called again, and she told them that her mother was an alcoholic who had made them lie to the social worker when they visited last time. She said that Linda was negligent, mean, and did not offer any discipline. But CAS really didn't believe her and didn't get involved. So in Sandra's mind, things aren't going the way she wants. And she's young and has a lot of potential to do great things with her life. She was a big dreamer, which is good. She dreamed of being a novelist, a movie producer, a rock star. And she talked about more practical jobs she'd like to do, like a flight attendant or a paramedic. But when it came to her mother, she just saw Linda as a lost cause. 
The drinking was destroying her. And it was only a matter of time before Linda would die of cirrhosis or kill herself in a drunk driving accident, according to Sandra. Yeah, because she was doing that. She'd drive a car drunk. There are a couple stories about some narrow escapes with mom driving. Yes, but she didn't have DUIs, so we're just no. depending on Sandra and Beth's story here. That's true. Although I would be surprised an alcoholic driving drunk wouldn't be unusual. <laughs> no. No. So here's Sandra. She's smoking pot on a daily basis, and she's thinking, how can I improve my life? And she decided in her wisdom that Linda was slowly killing herself, and she decided that she was going to hurry up the process of Linda's demise. Yeah, so pretty crazy, isn't it? <laughs> the way her mind worked there. Yeah, well, like you said, she's a teen. I know, but why not just run away from home? You're 16. Go live with your dad. Well, I don't know if that was an option. Go but... live with your relatives, because their, their aunt took care of them after their mother's death. I mean, there's plenty of places. There are, but I think with the aunt, the aunt thought that Linda was a good mom, and the daughters were a little bit of a terror at times. So I don't know if she would have taken them in. But there were certainly other options. Well, there certainly were. Linda had a $200,000 life insurance policy with Sandra and Beth and Bobby as the beneficiaries. So in the event of Linda's death, this money would be held in trust until their 18th birthdays. But Sandra thought that their aunt would give them an allowance when they went to live with her after they killed Linda. And then when they were 18, they'd get the big money. Yeah, now let's just think about this. $200,000 <laughs> divided three ways because it's three kids. It's like $70,000 each. It's not a lot of money. I mean, well, I, I it guess sure if you're is a if teen, you're a teenager. It sounds like a lot. I mean, it is a lot of money in any way you put it, but it's not going to set you up for life. Not even close. No, and to kill your mother for it is just unimaginable. It certainly is. And just having it planned out, well, we'll live with our aunt, and she'll give us an allowance. And then when we turn 18, we'll get all that money. That's just, I don't know, kind of wistful thinking, I guess. Well, and I would imagine the aunt would be using that money to raise them also well, for we, expenses. We found that out. Yeah, right. We'll, we'll see. We'll talk about that later. How much of that uh, $200,000 is actually left? Exactly. After the aunt gets through going through the money. That's a good point, yeah. So Sandra, anyway, decided she's going to get Beth on her side in this plan to murder their mother. And she worked hard to convince her sister that Linda's death would be the best thing for all of them, including Linda herself. Well, yeah, I guess that's a good way to put it. Mom, Mom's going to kill herself sooner or later. We might as well help her along. Well, yeah, they actually talked about it sometimes as a mercy killing. Yeah. Although I really don't believe that they felt that. I find that hard to believe. Yeah, and Sandra claimed that the money wasn't the motive for killing Mom. But it would be a nice bonus. Yeah. <laughs> and without Linda, they'd have freedom and independence. They could go where they wanted, when they wanted, and they could take care of each other. Yeah, and I think that's more what it was about, honestly. Yeah, absolutely. So they thought in some of their crazy discussions that to help with their expenses, they could live in the townhouse and have some friends move in with them. Or they could live with the aunt, who ha did have a nicer house. And one of the other bonuses of living with the aunt would be that their cousin lived there. He had a good supply of drugs. I think he was kind of a small-time dealer. Well, we got to set priorities here, right? Exactly. <laughs> so I know though Sandra resented taking care of Bobby for her mother, somehow the idea of taking care of him after killing Linda was okay with her. And she told Beth that Bobby would be much better off without Linda in his life. So here's another plus, right? We're going to... Not only is it good for you and me, it's good for our little half-brother. Yes. So at first, Beth didn't agree with Sandra that it was a good idea to kill their mom. But Sandra told her that she planned to kill Linda with or without her. She wasn't going to stop her. She also told Beth that Linda was only getting worse. And even if she did manage to get another job, she would drink and she would lose the job. So very fatalist thinking. Certainly is. She told Beth that killing Linda was the only way to help out themselves and Bobby. So this is the only way, pretty much what she's telling her sister. So one way that Sandra really got to Beth was by reminding her that their mother often drove while intoxicated. 
so there was a really good chance that she would end up killing all of them in a car crash one day. There had been one time when Linda was driving drunk and she talked about driving off of a bridge with all of them in the car. So this made it seem almost irresponsible not to kill Linda. Yeah. Well, that's kind of circular logic, right? Yeah, yeah. But we, we got to kill her before she kills us. Yeah, I mean, if she really felt that way, it's sad. So by 2003, Linda was in a pretty bad way. She was sleeping on the sofa and was drinking throughout the day, most every day. According to her kids, she was verbally abusive to the girls, telling them that it was their fault that she drank too much. Beth would say that she wanted to run away, but she didn't want to leave Bobby behind. Now Beth was 10 years old when her mother had Bobby, and she felt like a mother to him, just like Sandra did. So the family life was becoming pretty unstable. They had to move at least four times because Linda couldn't keep up with the rent. Then moving to going to new schools was difficult. Girls had trouble making friends and keeping friends. Well, and like I said, Beth really envied the lives of her friends who had spending money and, you know, supposedly more stable households. She was embarrassed of her cheap clothing that she had to wear over and over again to school. So she was more sympathetic, though, to Linda than Sandra was. She believed that Linda did want to be a good mom, but that her addiction prevented her from doing the right things. You know, she'd lost her job because she was drunk, and also she wasn't really there emotionally for the kids once she was drunk all the time. Right, and as you said, this is a disease. And it's not like Linda didn't want to be a mother to the kids. Yeah, that's the saddest part of the whole thing, is that if she could have gotten the right help, you know, if the kids could have been taken out of the home and she could have been put in a program, she could have been successful because she was a smart woman who did care about her kids. Well, there's a possibility there, yes. Yes. It's tough to get someone off their addiction to whatever it is. Absolutely, but she could have tried. She could have had a chance. Could have, yeah. So Sandra had eventually convinced Beth that Linda had to die by January of 2003. And by this time, they're talking about their mother like she's less than human. Well, like she's not even a person. Yeah, yeah exactly. And they're both using drugs and drinking and partying. You know, their grades had been A's, but now they were C's and D's and even lower sometimes. They were skipping classes and they weren't doing their homework. And they also began to slack off on the household chores, and they started staying out all night with their friends. So as teens, Sandra and Beth only saw things from their perspectives. They didn't think about how their mother had worked long hours and gone back to school in her efforts to try to better support them. And they didn't consider that maybe she did need help. They just saw her as a useless drunk. And they resented her for the boyfriends that she'd brought home who were verbally or physically abusive. Well, it's certainly not a good life, is it? No. No, not at all. Now, Linda's sister talked to Linda often, and she thought things were okay with the family. And the sister knew that Linda worked hard to provide for the kids, and she thought they had, if not a good life, at least an okay life. She had lent money to Linda when times were tight. Linda always paid her back. So she was thinking that her nieces were materialistic and selfish when they complained about their home life. And here's the heart of the story for me is nobody else lived there and knows exactly how bad it was. Right. Really, just the girls and Bobby, but he was kind of young to be able to say much about yeah, it. Yeah, I don't know how good a historian Bobby's going to be. But we don't know. I mean, was Linda horrible? Did she do all these things? Or were the girls very selfish and mean to their mother? And, you know, like most things in life, it's probably somewhere in the gray area. It's probably a combination of things. Oh, sure. I would always say that, that it's not as bad as the girls made it to look, and it wasn't as good as Mom thought it was. Exactly. So we're somewhere yeah. in the middle. I think so. When Sandra was planning her mother's murder, she did have a boyfriend, Donnie, and she also had a male friend who she confided everything to, and that was Jay. She was close enough to Jay that she told him all about her plans to kill her mother. In fact, Jay knew about the plan before even Beth did. Yeah, Sandra first told Jay about her plan one day at school. So he was pretty shocked initially because he never thought that Sandra would take her hatred of her mother that far. And Jay actually spent a lot of time at Sandra's home. According to him, Linda usually wasn't there. 
when he did see her, she seemed sober to him. So he never saw her do anything inappropriate. At the same time, though, he didn't live with her, so he believed Sandra when she told him that Linda was always drunk and neglectful of her family, of her kids. You know, Jay was 16, and he had known Sandra for three years. She had introduced him to Beth in December of 2002. When Sandra first brought up her plan to murder her mother with Jay, she hadn't decided how she would do it, though. She mostly talked about how great her life would be afterwards, so a lot of daydreaming and not very realistic expectations. She thought she would quit school and travel around the world with the money she got from life insurance. And she told Jay that she would take him and some other close friends with her to Amsterdam when they turned 18. But then she did also insist that the money was not her motive, just a bit of a bonus. Yeah, I know. Well, again, it's... I think it was more than a bonus to her. And and she just didn't have any real comprehension of how little $70,000 was going to go, was going to be. Yeah, I guess. I mean, it is a lot of money, Dick, but you're right. It's not going to last very long. You're still going to have to get a job and deal with reality. It's not a million dollars. No. But I think she's just looking for an escape. And, of course, the money would be part of that escape. Oh, sure. Now, she also confided in another friend, Ashley, early on. But Sandra had often talked about winning a Nobel Prize and becoming famous. So Ashley at first just kind of brushed off this murder plot as a way that Sandra was trying to get attention and shock her. As a teenage girl, Ashley had her own issues with her mother. So like Sandra, she did have thoughts of wishing her mother was dead. But to Ashley, this was just something rebellious teens would say to each other to blow off steam. Yeah, you know, just shooting the shit. Right. Ashley knew that Sandra's issues with her mother were more serious than her own issues with her mother. She had seen Linda drunk, and she had heard her tell her daughters about her sex life in embarrassing detail. Quite. I mean, wasn't she... Somebody said she was talking about anal intercourse in front of the girls. There was a lot of talk about that, yeah, about different things she said that were inappropriate, but... Totally. I just haven't really gotten to the details here because we don't know what was true and what wasn't. Ashley did say she had seen Bobby playing with one of Linda's sex toys, and Linda just laughed about it. Yeah, so there's another inappropriate thing. Possibly. And Ashley did feel sorry for Bobby because she thought he seemed to be neglected, and she'd never witnessed Linda being loving with her children, and she knew that Sandra thought her mother didn't love her. I mean, Ashley and Sandra had been friends since they were only 11, In the 10th grade, they were really confiding in each other, as teenagers do. Sandra began to dress more like Ashley, who was more popular, and she started to fit in better at school. Beth also got some fashion advice from Ashley. But Beth had a goth friend named Justin, who she wanted to impress. So she began wearing tight black clothing and makeup. And eventually, she and Justin did become a couple in 2002. But by the time she was in the 10th grade, the girls were really getting into drugs and guys. Ashley and Sandra took turns giving a guy oral sex in a movie theater one day. And this would end up being the first guy that Sandra had intercourse with as well. So they're getting into trouble. They're rebellious. They're going down a bad road. And they're blaming their mother for everything that's making them unhappy in their lives. They certainly are. So the plans for Linda's murder began to solidify in early January of 2003. Sandra and Beth had decided that it had to be done on a weekend when Bobby was away with his father. Well, thank goodness at least they thought of that. Yeah. They wanted her death to look like an accident so they could collect the life insurance payout. She couldn't simply overdose on alcohol and drugs because they didn't want to risk her death being labeled a suicide. So they decided, or at least Sandra decided, she would have to be drunk and on drugs, and she would have to drown in her own bathtub. And it's, at least in terms of planning a murder, that's not bad. (laughs) But that really never happens. Very unusual for someone to drown in their own bathtub. I mean, in the true crime brewery world, we've heard of it several times, but in real life, it's pretty rare. It is. And and when we've heard about it, I mean, it hasn't ever been termed accidental. There's always been someone who's murdering the person who drowned in the bathtub. But anyway, it sounds like a good idea in terms of murdering someone. I guess they had actually talked about different ways, and Sandra had even talked about burning her mother alive. 
So that would have been worse, I suppose. Jay, he agreed via MSN Instant Messenger to help Beth and Sandra with their alibi. And in that same conversation, Jay had written that drowning was one of the worst ways for someone to die. He added that Sandra had to be careful not to leave any marks on her mother, too. So the girls wanted to kill Linda on the night of Saturday, January 11th. But Jay and Ashley didn't like that idea because it would interfere with plans they had to party the next day. If Linda would die on the 11th, the girls would be busy acting sad on the 12th. And then they'd miss the big party. So they put off the murder until January 18th. Well, that's good of them. We can't miss those parties. But we're talking about now at least four, maybe five young people who know about this and are talking about it back and forth. Yeah, I mean, they, they're knowledgeable to some degree. Yes, and chatting about it on the computer, like nobody's ever going to find that. <laughs> right. Well, you know, we don't think about that. Well, apparently not. So on January 13th, Beth talked about the plan with her boyfriend, Justin. He was obviously already aware of this plan because he told Beth that drowning is different from asphyxiation. And it was important that they keep Linda underwater long enough for her to drown. At the same time, Beth didn't want to leave the water running in the tub because it could do damage to the, the bathroom in the townhouse. And then she asked Justin if he was going to help her with an alibi, and he said he's going to buy the movie tickets and tear them himself. So he's all in on it, really, if you think about that. Yeah, he's helping right he's, along here. He's realizing that drowning is a horrible way to die and that it's different. When the examination's done, they can tell the difference between asphyxiation and drowning. And then he's already planning to buy movie tickets and tear them up. And there was some discussion there also about the cost of the movie tickets. Did they really want to waste the money buying movie tickets when they weren't going to see the movie? <laughs> and it almost seems like Beth was more cavalier about this than Sandra. I mean, she was almost just kind of giddy about it with her boyfriend. Yes, yeah, she was. So Beth had rehearsed her story that she would give to the police. Then she talked about taking some money from Linda's bank account to pay for a dinner that night at Jack Astor's, which is like a bar and grill chain in Canada. She said she would be the one to call the police when they came home on that night of the 18th and found their mother in the tub. And she worried about having to act upset and cry on cue. But Justin really reassured her that she could do it. And before they signed off of that conversation, Justin added some more last-minute advice. Don't do the smother and put her in the tub thing, he wrote. If anything, I'd just get her really wasted. Then put her in the tub and hold her under for like 10 minutes. Then leave her for an hour or two. So he's pretty brutal. He sure is. He's a scary kid. If I was his mother, I'd be holy shit. That's upsetting. Now, so, some of that's probably trying to impress his girlfriend, but still, it's awful. It's terrible. So, January 14th, four days before the murder, Sandra chatted online with Jay again. She told him that she planned on doing something with her mom on Saturday so she wouldn't be able to hang out and drink with him on Sunday. She had been skipping school and told Jay that she didn't plan to return to school at all. Yeah, so when she said she planned on doing something with her mom, you have to put doing something in quotation marks because she meant she planned on killing her mother. Right. And it was obvious that Jay knew what she was talking about. Very obvious. And she told Jay that she planned to give her mother some Tylenol number threes, which have codeine in them, and keep giving her vodka. Then she put her in the tub, and she meet her friends back at Jack Astor's for the alibi. So Tylenol 3 and alcohol... Not something you should mix. Definitely not. And codeine is a narcotic. We'll get you to sleep. And so will sufficient alcohol. Right. So the combination can be lethal by itself. Yeah. So Jay actually wished Sandra luck and then helped her in figuring out how many Tylenol 3s that she should give to Linda. He asked Sandra if her boyfriend Donnie knew about her plans and Sandra said that he didn't. She said Donnie was never going to really understand her, and she should probably break up with him. He was her boyfriend, but she couldn't. So he was kind of seen as too nice of a guy to really be in on this. Yeah, we're going to keep him out of the loop. But he turns out to be a disappointment as well. He certainly does. So on January 15th, Sanders back talking with Jay. 
She was focused on what her life would be like after Linda was dead. She also added that Jay was going to help her and Beth with their alibi. So she said again she's leaving school. It was Bobby's birthday, but Sandra was planning his real party for after Linda was gone. And then before logging off, Sandra reminded Jay to delete their conversation from the computer. He told her that he'd already taken care of it, but it's still in the hard drive. Yes. So it's not deleted, deleted. Right. But I think that's the hard drive that disappears. We'll get to that. On January 17th, the day before the murder, Sandra was sitting in the school cafeteria with Beth, Jay, and her boyfriend Donnie. Sandra told Donnie that he couldn't go with her and her other friends to Jack Astor's on Saturday night. And he asked her why several times, but she refused to answer. So I guess what he had thought at that point was they were probably going to do some hard drugs or something that she knew he would disapprove of. And he really liked her, so he wasn't going to push it, apparently. Justin had Tylenol 3s at his house, and he gave several to Sandra, who planned to give four to six of the pills to Linda. During dinner on January 18th, Beth and Sandra began to give vodka to Linda in order to get her really drunk. And Sandra chatted online with Ashley while that was happening, telling her that she had given her mother four Tylenol 3s, along with a lot of vodka mixed in lemonade. Yeah, so by the end of dinner, Linda had ingested six Tylenol 3s, several glasses of wine, and a fifth of vodka. Wow. I know. Well, she was an alcoholic, so she probably had a pretty good tolerance. Right. But still, with the Tylenol 3s, which she didn't normally take drugs. Yeah, she might not have even known she was taking them. They were just kind of feeding them to her. Oh, yeah, I think so. I don't think she had any knowledge of that. So Sandra and Beth led their mother into the bathroom. Linda was pretty much unconscious and could hardly stand up. So they helped her get undressed and they lowered her into the tub. And once Linda was in the tub, Sandra put on latex gloves so she wouldn't leave fingerprints on her mother's body. She didn't want to see her mother's face as she held her head under the water, so Sandra told her to turn over. And while Beth stood in the doorway, she was watching as Sandra pushed Linda's head under the water. And they had decided that she needed to hold her under for four minutes, so she counted down as she held her. During his four minutes, the phone rings. This is like a bad movie, right? We're trying to kill somebody and we get interrupted by a phone call. It actually did become a bad movie, and we'll talk about that later. So Beth goes to answer the phone, and Sandra screamed at her, Get back here! Come help me! But it was Ashley on the phone, and Beth told her, Now's not a good time, and she hung up. Yeah, if it wasn't so tragic, it's kind of a funny scene. But of course, it's very tragic. It's horrible. By the time Beth did get back to the bathroom, Linda was dead. But she had some uh, twitching convulsions as she was dying. She hadn't even really been conscious enough to fight. Yeah. And once Linda was dead, Beth and Sandra left the townhouse and went to catch a bus down the street. They had Linda's debit card, and they planned to tell the police that Linda had given it to them to pay for dinner that night. But then when they're at the bus stop, Ashley pulls up in her mom's car and meets the girls. So she gets out of her mom's car and gets on the bus with the girls. As they all boarded the bus at 7 p.m., Sandra told Ashley that they did it. After chatting with Sandra online around 5.30 back at their house, Ashley believed that the sisters would carry out the murder, but now she was sure that they did. And she would later try and say she really didn't think they'd go through with it. But that just doesn't ring true. No, not from what we've researched. No, not at all. So they planned to meet up at Jack Astor's for their alibi because they knew people would remember, or probably remember, that they had been there. They would be seen out of the house with their friends while Linda got drunk and accidentally drowned in her bathtub. So as they got off the bus, Sandra took her latex gloves out of her coat pocket, threw them into a trash can. Then she also threw away the plastic sandwich bag that still had two Tylenol number threes inside of it. So Justin's waiting for them at Jack Astor's. He told Ashley that his mother had a prescription for Tylenol 3s for her chronic back pain, so it had been easy for him to get them for the girls. So Sandra told him that Beth had refused to help her, and she left the bathroom as she was drowning their mother. 
Yeah, but it was kind of uh, funny because Sandra seemed more upset than Beth at their dinner. Beth was talking and flirting with Justin, and Sandra was kind of sitting quietly and not eating. So Ashley was kind of surprised and disturbed to see how calm Beth seemed. But Ashley wanted to hear all of the details. Sandra explained to her how she held her mother's head and how her body had twitched. She said it wasn't how she had expected it to be. And Ashley would later describe the conversation as like watching a movie. Good description. Yeah, I mean, clueless, these kids. And heartless. Totally. After a couple hours or so, Sandra paid the bill and they all left the restaurant. Beth and Sandra went to catch the bus home. Justin went home. Ashley, however, met another friend of hers and they went to the movies. So I feel like she's just as cold as Beth or Sandra. Way cold. Scary girl. Let's take a short break here for one of our sponsors. Sure. You know, you can take coloring your hair at home to the next level with Madison Reed. Madison Reed gives you gorgeous professional hair color delivered to your door for less than $25. Madison Reed hair color is really one of a kind because it's multidimensional and they give you your choice of over 45 multi-tonal shades that have been developed by master colorists who really know how to blend the nuances of cool, warm, light, and dark. Many of our listeners have written to tell me how Madison Reed hair color has improved their lives, and I totally get it. Madison Reed delivers gray covering, natural looking hair color to my door when I want it. And I actually feel pretty comfortable changing colors, changing things up a bit with Madison Reed. I don't get any weird results. Everything turns out just like she says it will. So now I'm free from the lengthy salon visits that cost a lot of money, and my hair looks and feels better than ever. It's soft, strong, very natural looking. So I'm always happy to recommend Madison Reed to our listeners. It's affordable, convenient, and the quality is just great. We're busy women, so don't we deserve gorgeous professional hair color delivered to our doors on our schedule for less than $25? Of course we do. Find your perfect shade at madison-reed.com. And True Crime Brewery listeners get 10% off plus free shipping on their first color kit with code BREWERY. That's code BREWERY at madison-reed.com. So it's about 10.30 at night when Beth and Sander returned home. Sandra went upstairs to find her mother in the tub. When she opened the door of the bathroom, she saw her mother nude, lying face down underwater in the tub. Beth was supposed to be the one to call 911, but she just couldn't do it. She'd bragged online with Justin about how she could cry on cue, but she couldn't. Over the past couple of weeks, she and Sandra had rehearsed how the call would go. They'd even practiced crying, believing themselves to be good actors who could fool anyone. But in the end, it was Sandra who made the call. So at 10.33, she reached a 911 operator. The operator asked if Linda had a pulse and if she knew CPR, but Sandra said she didn't want to touch her. Linda was still underwater. The operator asked her to grab her mother and pull her out of the tub, but Sandra said she wasn't moving at all and she didn't know how she'd be able to lift her out of the tub. She also told the operator that she didn't want to try CPR. Now, I don't think an adult would have gotten away with this because this was a very weird way to be acting, to not try and save your loved one who's head under the water. They didn't even pull her head out of the water. Well, yeah, but the, on the other hand, you've been out of the house. Let's suppose they hadn't done anything to her. You leave the house to go meet some friends. You come back, and there's your mom face down in the tub, and she's not breathing, she's cold, and she's blue, and all that stuff. I don't, I don't think I need to pull her out of the tub to try to do CPR. I just say, God damn, mom's dead. No, because you wouldn't accept it that quickly. You'd want to try and save her. I truly believe that. Even if it seemed hopeless, you would try and pull her out of the water and at least check a pulse or something. I think this is just shitty. If this had been a husband finding his wife like that, he never would have got away with it. <laughs> never. Oh, man. Okay. I think they made a lot of allowances for them being minors, which, you know, is understandable. I mean, I could see a young person kind of freaking out and being unable to do that. But still, I don't think I would ever just leave someone I cared about's face underwater. 
I would want to just, you know, hope there was any chance at all, I would do whatever I could. And I think that's how most people would be. Well, I don't, uh, okay. But I, apparently you're just going to leave me there. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> too late. Yeah. Well, gosh, I'm sorry, but it's too late. You're obviously dead. I'm not taking you out of the no, tub. You're going to get in trouble then because it's not going to look good yes. to the jury. Okay, I'm going to remember that. Yes. So I'll pull you out of the tub first, <laughs> check a pulse, and then call 911 and say, yeah, she's dead. Yeah, I gave it I gave it all I had. I did. Right. So the police constable Blair Horner arrived within just a couple of minutes and knocked on their front door. Beth opened the door and let him in, and this was at ten thirty six PM, so only three minutes after the call had been made. The girls told them that they had found their mother face down in the bathtub, and they added that she was an alcoholic and that she had depression, and they both did seem quite upset at this point. Beth said that Linda had been watching TV and that she had given them her debit card so they could pay for dinner with their friends. And Horner went into the bathroom while the girls stayed by the front door. He saw Linda face down in the water with her legs bent and her right arm was hanging over the edge of the tub. So this was an odd position. You know, if you just passed out and drowned in the tub, you think you'd be lying on your back. And you think your head would be over on the opposite side of the faucet. Well, most definitely. They signed off on this as an accidental drowning, right? They did, yes. Well, there was one person who had said she had been sitting up and had slumped forward. And then there was another paramedic who said that she was laying face down. So there was some confusion there. It really wasn't handled the best way that it could have been. No, definitely not. But, I mean, if I'm an investigator looking at this, position is all wrong. And she's she's face down, not face up. And she's facing the faucet, not the other end. So, I mean, that just sounds suspicious to me. Well, that's why I said if it was her husband or her boyfriend or something, I think it would have been much more suspicious and treated differently. But okay. I think since it was her daughter's, you know, they don't think her daughters are going to kill her. Yeah, that would sound reasonable. Yeah, so they really didn't do everything they could have as far as preserving the scene. Also, I found it a little suspicious when I read that there was only about six inches of water in the tub. Yeah, that's another thing. That's weird. But Linda was obviously dead. There was no saving her. It had been hours. Now, when they took her out of the tub, she was still warm, but there was no pulse. And one of the paramedics tried to open her mouth to clear her airway, but her jaw was rigid. So rigor mortis had already set in. And this usually begins between four and six hours after death. Yeah, so I'm guessing the water in the tub was probably hot water, and that's why she was still warm? Yeah, well, it started out hot. Well, yeah. It had cooled down. That's what I mean, yeah. The girls were separated so they could be interviewed individually. The house was searched for medication. No Tylenol 3s were found but there was an empty bottle of vodka on the dining room table. Otherwise, the house looked pretty normal. When they were interviewed, Sandra and Beth gave pretty similar stories. They said that Linda often passed out when she was drinking. They said they had gone to Jack Astor's for dinner around 6 p.m. When they had left her, Linda was drunk, but that wasn't unusual. So they went to Jack Astor's, they had dinner, they returned home, they found Linda dead in the tub. And Sandra called 911 a couple of minutes later. So at least the alibi sounds okay to begin with. Yeah, it does. But during her interview, Sandra didn't cry at all. She was very calm and composed and spoke clearly. But, you know, everyone does respond differently in a tragedy. So the police didn't get especially worried about that. And Linda's death did look like an accidental drowning, although the circumstances were highly unusual. <laughs> Definitely. Beth had been crying and very upset at the townhouse, but she was much calmer at the police station during her interview. Now, because drowning in a bathtub is very rare, like I said, police had to treat this as suspicious because it just doesn't happen. Even if you're drugged and drinking, you usually wake up when your head goes into water. Yeah, as soon as your airway gets compromised, you rouse a little bit, right? Well, yeah, isn't it pretty much a reflex? You yeah. don't even have to think about that. Right. But there were no signs of a struggle in the bathroom. No toiletries had been knocked over or spilled. One odd thing was that the shower curtain was inside the tub, and of course most people would put the curtain outside of the tub before they got in to take a bath. 
but it could have been moved when Linda was lifted out of the water, or she could have left it there if she was drunk anyway. And, you know, it wasn't something they noticed before they took her out of the tub, because, of course, the paramedics are there with the priority of trying to save people before assessing a scene. Right. They're not there to record the scene. They're there to help save her. Exactly, yeah. So the police didn't take anything from the bathroom as possible evidence. They didn't do any fingerprinting. They didn't do any DNA swabbing. They thought that the possibility of suicide had to be considered, but there wasn't anything to indicate that there was a suicide. Now, after an autopsy, Linda's death was determined to be freshwater drowning due to excessive alcohol intake. Now, her blood alcohol level was 0.415. The legal level for drunk driving or drunkenness is 0.08. So she was five times over the legal limit. And this by itself, I mean, a, a blood alcohol of that amount could be fatal just by itself. Even if she hadn't been in a tub, she could have just been lying on a couch and stopped breathing. Well, that's what I think if the girls had taken her to bed instead of the tub. There's a good possibility she could have overdosed or aspirated on her own vomit because she was pretty much unconscious with dangerous levels. But, you know, no other drug tests were ordered. And that would have drawn their attention to the Tylenol 3s because the amount of alcohol in her system was enough to render her unconscious. But still, blood samples were taken and they were kept per procedure. I'm just kind yeah. of surprised about that, that they didn't do drug testing. Well, I think you, you explained it earlier. There's two teenage girls. They're not suspects at all. No, but I think that would just be part of the basic procedure, is to test that. Yeah, you would. Although, once they get the blood alcohol level, which is a quick test, probably you don't do anything else, right? Well, they didn't. But fortunately, they did have blood samples that they kept. Yeah. That was per procedure. And that's going to play a role. Absolutely. So Linda's co-workers knew that she had problems with alcohol. She had confided to them about the hard times her daughters had been giving her. The co-workers knew Linda had an alcohol problem, but they also knew that she was a pretty kind person who loved her kids. One of her co-workers said that Linda was proud of her daughters, telling her that the girls were excellent students. But that wasn't the impression that Sandra and Beth gave at their mother's funeral. No, apparently this was awful. Their behavior at the oh, funeral was just shocking and more upsetting. Than, more than awful. Sandra and Beth arrived at the funeral with their hair dyed green and pink and spiked, and they were wearing dark, kind of trashy outfits. They were also seen laughing and joking with their friends just steps away from their mother's casket. Now, co-workers remembered that Linda had been complaining that her daughters were disrespectful to her. And they could see it here, of course, because this behavior was just very shocking. It disturbed people who were there to mourn the death of this young woman. Sandra and Beth stayed with Linda's sister for several weeks after Linda's death. Then their father moved into the townhouse so the girls could live there. However, he was a strict person, and he insisted that they maintain a regular schedule with a curfew. So he was not as easily manipulated as Linda had been. Needless to say, this arrangement was a disaster. So the girls were back with their aunt by March, and she became their legal guardian. So, I mean, at this point, it doesn't really matter, I guess, but wouldn't it have been better for the father to keep them there and keep the rules and try and rein them in instead of sending them to their aunt's house? I feel well, like he wasn't very committed as a parent. Did he say, you got to take her back? Well, I don't know how it happened. But I would think he would be able to stay there with his daughters if he wanted to follow through with it. Uh, yeah, I would think. He's the blood relative. Yeah, but then the aunt became the legal guardian, and I'm not sure if that was something he wanted or not. Oh, probably. Yeah, we don't know. So, in the meantime, Ashley, Sandra's friend, was having doubts about going along with letting these girls get away with killing their mother. But she still didn't go to the police mostly because she was afraid that she would be charged as an accessory or in the conspiracy to murder. Well, that's a reasonable concern, don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. She liked to think that if she'd been at the townhouse that day, she would have stopped them. But, you know, she had other opportunities to speak up, and she hadn't, so there's no reason to believe that to be true. No, I mean, if only I had been there, I would have stopped him. But that's, that's just begging the question. She had ample times to thwart this... Uh, 
plot. Absolutely. Or to do something. And she didn't. And she did not. So I'm going to charge her, too. I know she didn't get charged, right? <laughs> she should have been, yeah. Well, also on the day after the murder, Sandra had called to tell Ashley that everything had gone well with the police. And Ashley had continued to be very supportive and to be Sandra's friend. Yeah, now Jay didn't find out that Sandra had gone through with the murder until the next day. And he was pretty shocked. And he was also worried that the police could charge him because he had given them advice on this murder, including to wear gloves so that they wouldn't leave fingerprints on her body. So Donnie, Sandra's boyfriend, was one of these kids who didn't know about the plan until afterwards. He got suspicious when Sandra called him that Sunday, the day after the murder, and told him that Linda had died in the bathtub the night before. He really thought this was too much of a coincidence that Bobby had been at his father's house and that Sandra was really hating her mother. He also remembered that Sandra hadn't wanted him to go to John Astor's that night. So it didn't take long. She confessed to him the following Tuesday. But he's a big disappointment because he continued to date her and didn't say anything either. Yeah, so his solution to this was instead of going to the police, he just decided to break up with Sandra. Yeah, but not until April. Yeah, it took a while. Yeah. I mean, this, Donnie's losing all cred here. He is because he was losing her anyway. It's not like he had any kind of um, ethics here. I mean, she was being more distant with him. She was smoking a lot of pot, and he finally broke up with her. But yeah. we're talking four months later. We're talking some time later, and we're talking about never considering going to the police. No sign of that, no. So Sandra began drinking and using more and more drugs. Then in November of 2003, so we're like, what, nine, ten months after the fact? Yeah, so they've basically gotten away with this. She's, they're free and clear, at least so far. But they're not quiet about it, especially Sandra. No, she started talking to an old family friend, and we'll call him David. He was a 21-year-old guy. He felt sorry for Bobby and the girls for losing their mother. Sandra confessed to David that she and her sister had murdered their mother. And he got very upset. Well, here we finally got someone with some ethics and some heart. David remembered Linda as being a pretty good mom who loved her kids. And he was also afraid that Sandra might kill herself because she had talked to him more than once about killing herself. So David decided he couldn't live with Sandra's secret. He spoke with a guidance counselor at his old high school. This guidance counselor was also an auxiliary police officer in Ontario. So in December, David went to talk to homicide detectives. And after hearing David's story, the police asked him to help with their investigation. Okay, so David wore a wire with a recording device, and he also drove a car with a hidden video camera. Yeah, he's tricked out. Yep. So in late December, he met with Sandra. Then in January of 2004, he also started meeting with Beth. Sandra told David that she and Beth were very good at lying. She was proud of it. And she agreed to answer his questions about the murder because he said it was bothering him and he was thinking about it a lot and he'd like to just get it off his chest by hearing about what exactly happened. And they fell for it. Both Beth and Sandra were recorded as they described how they had planned and carried out Linda's murder. So it worked. That worked. And the girls were arrested in January of 2004. So they'd gotten away with it for a year. The morning they were arrested, more than 50 police officers met early in the morning to apprehend the sisters and to apprehend anyone else who had information about the murder. So we got teams of police picking up Justin, Jay, Ashley, Donnie, and other friends of Beth and Sandra. The girls were arrested at their aunt's house where they were living in the basement. They were wearing pajamas, and they were also surprisingly calm, and they declined the officer's offer to allow them to get dressed. So they were arrested in their jammies. Yes, and people would try and use that against the police, so that's why that's important. Beth asked if she could go to school and take an exam that morning, and Sandra said they had a party to go to that day. But both girls were reminded, hey, you're being arrested for murder here. Yeah. So <laughs> You ain't going nowhere. You're not going to be going anywhere for some time, right? So still kind of a break with reality. Search warrants were executed at their aunt's house, also at their school lockers. The townhouse complex where Linda and her kids had lived was visited by police who went door to door. 
to see if any of the neighbors knew anything about Linda's death. Sandra talked to the police, and she declined to have an adult or an attorney with them. Then she finally broke down and confessed after she was told that Beth would be held equally responsible for Linda's death. So, trying to protect her sister here. Then she said that she held Linda's head under the water. She said that Beth knew nothing about it, though, until Sandra had already begun drowning her. Which the police are easily going to find out that isn't true. I mean, they already have recordings of her. Right. As well as when they do the computer examination, they're going to find a lot. Well, it's a good attempt. So Beth denied any involvement in her mother's death, and she refused to talk to the detectives. But unlike the United States, where detectives had to stop questioning once the suspect asks for an attorney, law in Canada is more flexible. So the detectives continued to try to get her to talk. One detective even played some of the videotape from David's car, where she had incriminated herself, but Beth didn't say anything. Yeah, so it kind of turned out like Beth was more hardcore than Sandra, which was a surprise. Yeah, you're leading up to Sandra being kind of the ringleader. Right, right. Well, she's the one that did the actual murder. Yeah, but Beth's a hard ass. Seems to be, at least post-murder she was. So they both appeared in court on January 22nd for their arraignment, and Sandra's lawyer began criticizing the police for treating the frightened young girls badly and said that they didn't even allow them to change into their street clothing or bring their teddy bears with them. Now, come on, these girls didn't have teddy bears they were holding. Good try, though. No. Good lawyering, I'd say. And they were given the opportunity to change. Well, that's what the police said. But the police did still need more evidence to complete a strong case against the girls. A forensic data specialist found many of the MSN instant messages plus emails and websites that had been visited on their home computer. There were many details of the planning of the murder, as well as of the murder itself. There were over 14,000 hits on the word drown found on the computer, as well as 247 hits on the word Tylenol. So that would really not look good for them. Suspicious. They also found a document that had been accessed on January 14th, 2003, so that would have been four days before the murder, and it was titled The Inhalation of Water, The Drowning Process. There were also web searches on the effects of mixing alcohol and codeine, and the information found matched up with what the girls had been recorded telling David. So they had a lot now. A lot of evidence. Circumstantial, but strong. Yeah, and then then there's an interesting thing. When they searched Justin's computer, the hard drive was missing, and it was never found. Okay, so it was Justin's. I knew one of the guys had gotten rid of their hard drive. And then they tested Linda's blood samples that they had uh, retained, and the blood samples showed large levels of codeine and acetaminophen, the ingredient in Tylenol. Right, so the Tylenol 3s. And police knew they had no hard evidence that she knew about the murder in advance, but Ashley felt she was in danger of going to jail. Then a few months after Beth and Sandra were arrested, Donnie wrote a short story for his English class, and this story included a drunk mother, her two angry daughters, pain pills, a bottle of vodka, and a bathtub drowning. (laughs) The older girl drowned her mother as her younger sister stood in the doorway. So here we have a little bit of uh, art imitating life. Well, that's uncanny, isn't it? Certainly is. He thought this up all by himself, huh? (laughs) Yeah. Jeez, that's just sad. But in April, Beth and Sandra were let out on bail with house arrest at their aunt's house, and their aunt was convinced that they were innocent. She was very supportive. Justin was arrested that summer for conspiracy to commit murder. Ashley and two other friends were not charged. But they agreed to testify for the prosecution, and that's what saved them. I guess they really thought they needed that testimony to get the two girls. Yeah, so we made a little deal. Yes. So Beth and Sandra didn't act like you might suspect teenagers arrested for murder to act. They were defiant, and Sandra continued to share the details of the murder with people. And she even put out nude pictures of herself on an American website. Yes, quite a few pictures. Quite a few. So the trial lasted eight weeks. Prosecutors argued that the girls had killed Linda 
because she was ruining their lives and because they wanted to collect her life insurance. The idea that Sandra wanted to save Bobby from a neglectful mother kind of fell off after Ashley testified because she said that Sandra had joked about killing Bobby next and she had said that she hoped Bobby would go to live with his father so she could be free and do whatever she wanted to do. So that doesn't seem like someone who cared a lot about her little brother. Not at all. The girls seemed to enjoy all the attention they were getting. It was noted in the Toronto Star that they actually giggled when autopsy testimony was given. In December of 2005, both girls were found guilty of first-degree murder. Right, but they're not going to go to prison for life, as you might expect. In the sentencing phase, the court heard about how they had tried to get help from the Children's Aid Society and other adults, but they had kind of been left on their own to care for Bobby and their home. No one was helping them, so they decided that killing their mother was the only solution. The judge said that the girls loved their mother, but they were in a dysfunctional environment, and their high school guidance counselor testified that they were the smartest girls he'd ever met. So they still had quite a bit of support. Yeah, I mean, just the testimony that they're the smartest girls I've ever met. <laughs> what the heck? Even even smart people might kill people. Well, yeah, it doesn't make you a good person if you're smart, does it? No. A psychiatrist testifying for the defense said that the most striking part of the case was the role that their group of friends played, and I agree. Absolutely. I mean, they did nothing to stop the murder, and they actually were encouraging them. For them, it seemed like it was all about the drama and the excitement as they collaborated on these plans. They were having fun with it. Well, they certainly seemed to be. I mean, I, I would only hope that they were under the uh, impression that it was all a joke and they were playing along with the joke, but that's not true. Well, you know, I'd like to hope that too, and it could have started out that way. But I think there was a point where they had to know it was serious when you're setting up alibis. And then even then, let's say you thought it was all a joke. But then they come to Jack Astor's and tell you. Yeah. At and, that point, you need to go to the police. And, and, and you know pretty quickly that they did, in fact, kill the mother. Right. That's when you need to go to the police, like well, you said. But the sad part about that is it was too late to save Linda. So right. it really but, would have been best if someone had said something beforehand. Well, it would have been. But, I mean, it, look, it took them a year to get to the point where they could arrest him. Yes, it did. And if well, they, they hadn't been shooting their mouths off so much, they, they could have gotten away with it. Well, if it weren't for David, I wonder if any of the others would have ever gone to the police. I'm not sure they would have. I mean, at first they were into it, and then afterwards they're covering their own asses, really. Yeah, they are. Justin, Beth's boyfriend at the time of Linda's murder, was charged separately with conspiracy to commit murder. He had assisted in planning, and he provided the Tylenol 3s. Now, of course, he denied this. He said he had not given the girls the pills. But the police had records of online conversations where he was suggesting ways to mislead the authorities and to create an alibi for them. Now, he ended up with an 18-month sentence, which I think is very short. Also in appeals, his conviction was upheld, but his sentence was reduced. So he really only got eight months locked up and four months of supervision. That's a pretty nice sentence, isn't it? Yeah, for conspiracy to commit murder? Yep. Absolutely. So an investigator wanted to show that Linda was really not as bad as the girls made her out to be. So Sandra and Beth and some of their friends said that Linda was a drunk who never took care of her children. She put alcohol before her family. But there are plenty of others who never believed that. So we have David, who was the informant, He'd known the family for years, and he didn't think that the situation was anywhere near as bad as Beth and Sandra were telling people. Then many of Linda's former co-workers said she was a very well-liked, hard-working person, and she always tried to help others. Now, they would concede that she did suffer from alcoholism, but she appeared to be a devoted mother. She also often worked double shifts, and she went to night school trying to advance her career in order to earn more money for her family. She was very proud of her daughter's academic performances. Now, yes, she had issues she's trying to deal with, including an abusive ex-boyfriend and her sexual relationship with a lawyer who had no intention of it being long-term. And let's be frank, her daughters were not making life any easier for Linda. 
No, Beth and Sandra were rebellious, and Linda was actually afraid that they were getting out of control. Sandra was also stealing money from Linda. She had cashed in a savings bond that Linda had bought for the girls' college expenses. In the days leading up to her death, Linda was becoming more and more depressed, and you can see why. It's a rough life she's living. She was trying to work two to three jobs at a time. She was studying at night. She did love her kids, and she did want to improve their lifestyle. But Sandra was so critical of her mother that nothing would really have been good enough for her. And she often threatened to call child welfare when Linda tried to set limits. When CAS came to the home the second time in June of 2001, Sandra told the social worker that her mother didn't love her, that Bobby was a spoiled brat, so that's the opposite of what she'd been saying about him being neglected, and that she wanted the social worker to place her into a wealthy foster home. So these motives for calling CAS were questioned. I mean, did she just want to go live with richer people so she could have more stuff? Kind of seems that way. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? It does. Also, Linda had told a co-worker more than once that she felt like she was losing control of her daughters. You know, she was living on a fixed budget, and she was frustrated. Her daughters wanted more than she could afford. The girls and their friends would actually be at the house and trash it and eat all the groceries while Linda was away at work. And, of course, they didn't show any appreciation when Linda did make sacrifices. Essentially, Linda had felt like her girls were mean to her and very destructive. So I'm not trying to say Linda was perfect by any means, but there was certainly more to the story than Beth and Sandra were letting on. Well, like you said before, there's two sides. Absolutely. So in Sandra's pre-sentencing report, her probation officer said that Sandra savored every moment of killing her mother, both in the planning and in the act itself. Sandra viewed it as a mercy killing, and she was convinced that Linda would understand why she had to die. Sandra had recalled wanting to remember every detail as she drowned her mother. So that's disturbing. Quite disturbing, isn't it? Because this young woman is out in society now. Scary. Now, of course, it doesn't help the situation that the girl's father was a strange guy, and he just wasn't a very helpful person. He had a master's degree, but he was very secretive about how he earned a living. Now, he and Linda had separated in 1989, and he was only given supervised visitation with his daughters after over three years of fighting in court. And he certainly saw less of them as they got older. So there's some issues on the father's side, isn't there? Well, yeah, if he had supervised visitation, there was definitely something going on we don't know about. Right. So that's another thing Linda had to deal with. And just as a mother, I can sympathize with a lot of this stuff. Now, in Beth's pre-sentencing report, it basically said that she was the more evil of the two and that she was basically motivated by greed. Now, she denied that money had anything to do with the crime. She said she was concerned that her mother would kill herself, or Bobby, or someone else while out driving intoxicated. She also said that not one friend she had talked to had told her not to kill her mother. They had all tried to help with the planning by making suggestions. (laughs) So that's something. Yeah. You've got a 15-year-old who's confused and troubled. And nobody was helpful with that. They made it worse. No, they are all egging her on. Now, Linda's sister, who was the legal guardian of the girls, had been paid $133,000 out of the insurance policy. Somehow she spent almost $100,000 of that. And there's no discussion about where that went. I guess some of it went to lawyer fees and stuff like that. But... Well, no, no, no. 60000 was held for Bobby. So yes. she'd only spent about 73000 $60,000 was separate from the 133 dollars It's a $200,000 policy. Oh, they each right. got a third of it. You're right. Okay. So she spent nearly $100,000 of the girl's money. In a year. Now, I know she paid for the funeral and some other things, but you're right. That was a lot to spend. Yeah. But we're not pointing any fingers, right? Well, no, because we don't know where it went. But because the money wasn't misused by Linda's daughters and it was controlled by Linda's sister... It was agreed that all of the remaining money would be given to Bobby as well. So it wasn't seized by the court as proceeds of the crime. If Beth and Sandra had been 18 18 years old when they committed this murder, they would have gotten life in prison. But they had much lighter sentences because of Canada's Youth Criminal Justice Act. 
So the YCJA changed how Canadian courts dealt with violent youth offenders, and it requires the court to give sentences giving the best chance of rehabilitation. So the judge in this case had no choice but to impose youth sentences. But, you know, at the same time, it was an unusual case, very unusual. Certainly was. Most teen killers in Canada are males, and their crimes are usually spontaneous. You know, robbery, fight, something like that. In 2005, there were only nine teenage girls charged with homicide. And usually when a teen has killed a parent, there's no planning involved. But these girls had planned their mother's murder for months. So Sandra was released to a halfway house in 2009, and Beth was released in 2010. Beth's attorney tried to get her released in 2009, but her counselor told the court that she needed more psychological help before she would be ready to move forward with her life. So this counselor said that Beth had to deal with childhood issues still and some triggers that had led to her role in her mother's murder. Now this is disturbing because she also added that Beth still had little empathy for others, that she saw herself as better than other people. She was easily irritated and she continued to have distorted thinking. Now this was less than a year before she was released. Yeah, so she must have made real progress in that year. Yeah, well, or learned what to say. I don't know. Oh, you're so cynical. (laughs) So after her release, Sandra went on to study engineering at a Canadian university. And Beth went on to law school, got married, and she's had at least one child. Now that's as far as we know. Well, you said she was doing some legal work, right? She was a uh, researcher, I I thought. I read someplace for a law firm. But it was questionable if she'd be able to take the bar because of her history, because you have to have um, good conduct or something. Well, she has a felony on her record. Well, it's not on her record, Dick, because she was a minor. Okay. But it could be just, you know, poor character. It could be held against her like that. But she has no record for this. Right. Well, and, and just... I mean, it didn't say she passed the bar. It just said that she did research. Right, and was planning to go to law school. We don't know what happened after that. You know, these sentences just seem lenient. But at the same time, the purpose is to hold offenders accountable and reintegrate them back into society, which is a, an idea I really agree with. Actually, many studies have shown that reintegrating youth offenders is much better for society than just keeping them incarcerated for their entire lives. And it's been successful quite a bit. It has, yes. So what do we know about teens who kill their parents? It's pretty rare. It is. Now, there are certain characteristics that are present in teens who have killed a parent. So in sons who do this, schizophrenia is a common factor. Sons kill their father more often than they kill their mothers. We know that. And sons who kill their mothers are often described in terms of the Orestes complex, which is in referral to classical Freudian psychoanalysis as the son's repressed urge to murder his mother. This term stems from the ancient Greek story of Orestes, who murdered his mother Clytemnestra and her lover Agamemnon. Now, daughters who kill a parent often have a history of a hostile and dependent relationship with the mother. More commonly, over 80% of the time, actually, daughters who kill their mothers are middle-aged, not teens. So we got an unusual situation in this case. Yeah, pretty much unheard of. Yeah. And in a homicide report including information from 1976 to 1999, daughters were the killers in just 16% of matricides. Well, it seems like as a society, we're really kind of fascinated by parasite. We've done other cases about people who kill their parents or a parent. And the oldest one I can think of would be back in 1892, Lizzie Borden, who became famous when she was accused of killing her parents with an axe, of course. But I didn't know that she was actually acquitted. For some reason, I never knew that. And then we have Charles Whitman who was the mass killer from a shooting rampage in the University of Texas at Austin. He killed his mother before he went off on his shooting spell. And then we can't forget the Menendez brothers. Yes, but it usually definitely is guys that do this. Yeah, very few women. 
wasn't it the Sandy Hook shooter also killed his mother before he went on his rampage? One of those school shooting guys, I think, was Sandy Hook. Yeah. Well, it's a fascinating topic, although disturbing. I just hope that they become women who are ethical and live good lives. That's all I can say. Well, I guess, uh, at least so far, we don't have any information of the contrary. No, they haven't been caught killing anyone else that we know of. So, that's good. Yeah. So our sources for this discussion, they include Sage Publications on Trauma, Violence, and Abuse from 2010 by Kathleen Hyde and Autumn Frey. We also used the Wikipedia page on Canadian law to learn about the sentencing in Canada. Also from Current Psychology in November of 2010, we read an article called Parasite Characteristics of Sons and Daughters Who Kill Their Parents. And the authors of this article were Sarah G. West and Mendel Felcher. A big source here was the Toronto Star articles by Bob Mitchell. And also the book by Bob Mitchell on this case titled The Class Project, How to Kill a Mother. Now, I had alluded earlier to a 2014 movie based on this case, which is available on Prime Video, and that's titled Perfect Sisters, which was just a terrible movie. <laughs> What did we watch? About 20, 30 minutes of yeah, it? Yeah, and I can watch a bad movie. I've watched a lot of bad movies, but this was just dreadful. This was worse than bad. Yeah, and it was panned in Canada as really portraying the girls as more victims, which they certainly weren't. Well, not from what we discovered or, or looked up. No. It didn't seem that at all. Nope, not at all. Okay, Jill, let's plug the podcast for a minute. All right, a quick plug before we do feedback. Just a reminder that our September TCB Premium episode was about Pastor A.B. Shermer, who was charged with killing two wives. It's called A Wolf in Shepherd's Clothing, and it was definitely eye-opening to research, and we enjoyed our discussion on that. We're currently finishing up our research for our October Members Only episode. We've got over 30 Members Only episodes that we've done over the past couple of years, and it's easy for you to get access to them if you feel the need for more TCB in your life. You know, do you start itching between Tuesdays, waiting for your next TCB fix? Then you might want to consider supporting the podcast and getting these extra episodes by going to tiegrabber.com. When you go to tiegrabber.com, all you have to do is click on the gold subscribe button. And as soon as you subscribe, you can get access to all 30-something premium episodes. We also have options to pay monthly, quarterly, or annually. And you get to choose your own welcome gift that I'll send you with a personal thank you. Another thing, when you visit our new website, I'd like to suggest that you check out our shop. We have just about everything that you could want to put our logos on. And that's with our collaboration with Tee Public, who have a lot of great deals. I mean, every day or so you can get 30 to 35% off and get yourself a nice sweatshirt for the winter for a good price. Or whatever. Yeah, I got a bunch of stuff from them. Well, I really like the lightweight sweatshirts because usually the hoodies are so thick and heavy and they have these lightweight hoodies that are just perfect for a chilly evening. Yeah, I, I might remind you that the one I had, you stole from me. Well, that's the one I'm talking about. It's mine now. Yes. Yes. Well, we certainly appreciate any support you give to the show and we just want to thank you in advance, whether you listen weekly, if you contribute your comments or suggestions, if you support our sponsors like Madison Reed or if you subscribe to True Crime Brewery Premium or Shop the Brewery. We appreciate it all. We certainly do. Thank you. Yes, thank you. On to feedback. Okay, so I'm going to continue with my recent pattern. I have one voicemail and two emails for you. So the first voicemail is from Jordan. Hi, it's Jordan Abramson. I'm a huge fan of your, sh of your podcast. Uh, I listen to it every day and every night. I was wondering if you could do the case of Elliot Roger. He was the young man who uh, stabbed his three roommates in Santa Barbara and then took to the streets and uh, started shooting people. And he, he killed uh, three more people and injured 13. Uh, he then turned the gun on himself and he eventually, of course, died. There is a 141 page manifesto online. If you could like go through that, and maybe uh, just uh, do one of your podcasts on him. That'd be great. Yeah, this kind of hits close to home for me because uh, I live in Timmy Valley, California, and he uh, grew up in the San Fernando Valley, which is right over the hill, which was kind of creepy for me because uh, I realized that a mass murderer grew up not too far away from me. Uh, yeah, so uh, 
if you could do uh, that, that'd be great. So uh, I enjoy your podcast. Bye. Well, thanks, Jordan. We don't get a lot of feedback from the boy types, so that's nice. I've been recruiting them. Have you? Yeah. <laughs> Bringing them in, telling them it's really a cool place to hang out. That's what I do. Yeah. So, but this, and he's pretty much given the story. This guy obviously had some mental illness. Uh, he killed two of his roommates and one of their friends at his apartment by stabbing them. Then he drove a little later to a sorority house. Couldn't get into the house, but he shot three women outside the sorority and killed two of them. Then he drove to a deli that was nearby, and he shot and killed a male student. So that's six dead. Then he began driving through Isla Vista, the town they lived in, just shooting people at random and hitting people with his car. So police had been called at this point. They twice engaged him during the attack. He had a gunshot wound to his hip. But they eventually crashed his car, and while he was in the car and the police were advancing on him, he shot himself in the head, killing him. Then the interesting thing, he left this, as Jordan said, 140-page manifesto where he was attempting to explain his actions. And I have some copies. I have started looking at that. This is just a scary thing to read. I bet it is, yeah. I mean, there's really no sane explanation for that behavior, obviously. No. Now, these are touchy cases, and I guess the main thing is, can you learn anything from talking about it? Which I guess would be the case with any of the crimes we cover. We feel that way. Okay, so we should consider doing that then. I got it written down. Okay, good. Now, we have an email from Caitlin, and that's a case suggestion. Yeah, she wrote a longer letter, and I've kind of edited it, but it was some good suggestions. All right, so Caitlin wrote, have you looked into the Dakota James case? I was born and raised in and still live in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and this case rocked the city back in 2017. Dakota suddenly disappeared and then was found in the Ohio River 40 days later. His death was ruled an accidental drowning, but many people and myself think there is more to the story, including the possibility of a serial killer or a group called the Smiley Face Killers. I'm personally not sure about a serial killer or group, but I do think foul play may have been involved. So Dakota James was a 23-year-old graduate student who disappeared on the night of January 22, 2017, after a night of drinking with some friends. Forty days later, he was found in the Ohio River. Now his death was ruled a drowning, but his parents have suspected foul play. Dr. Cyril Wecht, reviewed the autopsy and concluded that Dakota likely was strangled. And one consideration was that Dakota had been the victim of the Smiley Face Killers, a possible interstate gang of serial killers, so named because of graffiti near the scene of their crimes. But the case hasn't been reopened. Now, I haven't really heard about the Smiley Face Killers other than I saw, maybe it was on Netflix, that there's some kind of series or movie about it. Yeah, I mean, when we say possible gang, I mean, I think this might be one of those urban legend type of stories. Okay. So I'm not sure one way or the other whether there is a group called the Smiley Face Killers. Well, we should watch that documentary or whatever yeah, it is, we, find out more. We need to check this out a little bit more. But I mean, the thing that really grabbed my attention was that the Dr. Cyril Webb. I know, he's your boy. You like him. That that doctor thought he was strangled. I'd like to know why, so I'd like to look into that a little bit more. I mean, it seems like drowning and strangling are pretty obvious differences. Yeah, the, the little bit I read was that there were some marks on his neck that could be construed as evidence of strangulation. But otherwise, I mean, it's a typical story. A young kid out drinking with his buddies, maybe got overserved or got intoxicated and fell into the water. Sure, that happens. And of course, parents are always suspicious of something because they just don't think that their child could yeah, do that. Well, his parents said that basically <laughs> he knew how to drink. He wouldn't have gotten so drunk that he would fall into the water. Well, then maybe they know him, you know. We don't know. He was on a swim team. Oh, well, there you go. That's strange. Well, we'll definitely look into that one. We certainly so, will. Thank you, Caitlin. Now we have one more case suggestion, and this one's from Julie. This is Julie. You want me to take this? Yes, please. 
Okay, I'm going to edit her stuff because she's too complimentary for your tastes. Okay. So Julie says, I am a huge fan of your podcasts, but there seems to be a state missing in your library, and that's the gem state, Idaho. So my family moved from Ohio to Idaho to be closer to my hubby's family about 20 years ago, and I have a suggestion for a podcast that I have not seen anyone else take on. It's on Joseph Duncan. The scum of the earth is a serial child abductor, molester, and killer. So I'm sending some links to see if you two can stomach this non-human long enough to do research for a very sick podcast. So Julie, I would just say at the beginning, this might not be the best way to put out your ideas for a podcast. Well, I think it's it's good. She's being honest. She I certainly is. I appreciate that. And then she gives you a beer suggestion She's as well, She's got some huh? beer suggestion, and she tells us how great we are, <laughs> which we already know. Well, I, I know how great you are. Okay. So, <laughs> anyway, so this guy, Joseph Duncan, killed a mother, her daughter, and the mother's boyfriend in 2005. And he kidnapped the women's two other children. The little boy was killed, but he spared the little girl because, according to him, the girl taught him how to love again. And he was arrested while sitting in a restaurant with this girl. So he was very creepy. I can't wait to dig into this a little bit more. Duncan was convicted of these murders, plus one in 1997 that he had gotten away with for a while. He also confessed to killing two other young girls in Seattle, but hasn't been charged, or at least hadn't been charged at the time I was reading things. A number of murders on his hands. Serial killer, yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks, Julie. And she did say a lot of nice, complimentary, and encouraging things that we didn't read, but we do appreciate those things. We didn't read them because Jill doesn't want us to read them. Oh, I'd be under the table. That's right. Yes. She cringes when I start talking about this stuff, so... We left them. I left them. But thank you for your thoughts, Julie. I agree with them. But I definitely see some interest from Dick on this case. I can tell when you're interested in doing a case, and I see that you are interested in this one, truly. Absolutely. So you've done a little reading about it, I would imagine. I've, I've done some reading, and it's just fascinating, and I just need to know a little bit more. Okay. So that's going to be on our suggestion list. I got it. All right. Well, thanks to everyone who's left us feedback and everyone who's listened today. We definitely do appreciate it. We certainly do. We love feedback. So we'll save a seat for you at the quiet end. Come see us next week. Yeah, I got some beer for you. (laughs) Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.